Okay. So let's give me one second here. Uh, I have to do something here. I just want to say welcome everyone while I'm waiting, while I'm, uh, let me put on my video. I'm going to be recording this and streaming it. So just give me one little second. I thought I had everything set up here for a minute, but uh, looks like it wasn't. Uh, Okay. Let's try this again. All right. Give me one second here. So we're going to be looking at, as you can see behind me, we're going to be looking at uh, the King of the North and his increase in power. And this is going to be part two. Uh, we had a request last week to do a part two. And so we're going to go ahead and do that part two this week so if you just bear with me one second here I am I had everything set up but then something happened here just one little second and we'll get going all right all right let's see here you know every time you go to stream uh, you gotta copy a different stream key and so that's what's happening now. Just uh, putting in the new stream key in, and hopefully that will be that will be the the little trick to get this thing streaming now. Okay. So let's see if that works. Okay. Looks like it's going to be working now. Okay, so we're we're. It looks like we're on track right now. So I just want to thank you all for joining again uh, for this part two of the King of the North and how he's increasing in power. As I said last week, there was a a, a request to do a part two. So last week we began the study re regarding this King of the North and how he's increasing in power. Our study was based on, for those of you that might not have been here last week, it was based on Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45. And um, I'm going to go ahead and, and ask you just to bow your heads with me and, and, and close your eyes as we pray before we get started, before we even read this quotation. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for bringing us together to study your word one more time this week lord and these opportunities are so precious because we know that things are are just closing in little by little and they're going to we know continue to intensify and as we're getting close to entering into a new year we know dear father there's already plans being made behind the scenes that are going to take people uh by shock and so dear father we we don't we know that you have revealed the secrets to us because you have promised to do so. You have. You are the God that knows the end from the beginning. And you give us all of the information that we need so that we're not caught unaware as like uh, a big part of society will be. And so, dear Father, we come before you to ask you to speak to our hearts and to continue to unravel uh, things to us so that we can uh, know how things are, are moving and we too can also move with these movements uh, and even move ahead of these movements to uh, do the final work that you have called us to do, dear God. For we know, Lord, that this work will be cut short uh, or else everybody would probably be destroyed. And so, dear Father, we thank you. We praise you. We see so many catastrophes taking place all around the globe. And they're just intensifying in, in such a degree that even scientists are, are, are shocked. And so, dear Father, be with us as we come before you. We know that our protection is in you, so we pray that you continue to fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit. We pray that Jesus will be our rock of salvation. He will be our shield and buckler, our strength to move forward in this great battle uh, and, and be victorious in it. And so, dear Father, as we 
Study your word. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding. Use me as your mouthpiece. Empty me of self, dear God. We thank you for, for allowing us to uh, stream this right now. We pray for all those that may be watching this even online. We pray, dear God, that you would give us uh, the ability to grasp these things and to be aware of what you are revealing to us so that we can uh, cooperate with you in the final battle. We thank you, dear God, and we praise you. We ask this in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. So our study that we started last week was based on Daniel 11, 40-45. We'll read that again. It says, And at that time, or at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him, like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps, but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Now, if you didn't see part one, I would encourage you to go see part one. We looked at a lot of these uh, symbols in here. And this is an end time prophecy, by the way. For those of you who might not know this, Daniel 11, 40 to 45 are an end time prophecy. And we're right at the end of this prophecy. And uh, many of the things, now let me just say that this has had probably a, a, a couple of applications. If you, it, it, This is not a one application prophecy. This prophecy has had probably several applications. Uh, when you think about the king of the north in ancient times, it was Babylon. King of the south was Egypt. Uh, during the time of um, the time of the end, as it says here, and at the time of the end, which is we were we showed last week, which was seven is seventeen ninety eight, when the time of the end began, there were certain things taking place at that time, and uh, we showed that, and some some of the um, some of the. Uh, uh, Pioneers, you know, they had their own interpretations and, and you know, they had some good, you know, logical uh, interpretations to these, these, this prophecy, uh, but they didn't really understand it fully and they didn't understand the spiritual significance of it or the symbolism and how it applied to the end. They didn't really know at the end who was going to be the king of the north and who, the, who, who would be the king of the south. Uh, some would argue, you know, that... Um, uh, Uri Uriah Smith, you know, had had a bunch of details in regard to uh, Turkey and uh, Napoleon and the battles that were going on in Egypt and all over the place, and and he he kind of lines up a lot of things and and it may, it looks like it makes a lot of sense and it probably did have some type of application in regard to what he was saying, but you know this prophecy is more for our day in reality because it has to do with the end of the world. Um, and in the very next chapter, Daniel 12, verse 1, Jesus comes. So this is a prophecy dealing with the end of, uh, of time. And, and like I said, it might have had an application to those things that Uriah Smith was talking about maybe in, in his time. Um, uh, you know, James White had a whole different interpretation. Um, uh, you had also A.T. Jones had, was kind of also in agreement with, uh, with some of Uriah Smith's uh, information. And, uh, you know, you had, uh, I think Hiram Edson also, had, he had a different interpretation. I think he was more in line with probably James White. So they, they, there was a little bit of conflict back then to what all these things meant. Because they, they were learning, they were growing, and, you know, they, they, had a, they, they didn't have all the pieces of the puzzle, I, I would say. But we have been given some serious insight, and we know that in today's application, it's... it's, it's uh, symbolically, the king of the north is the papacy. And even at the time of Napoleon, we saw that Napoleon was coming and he, he gave a mighty blow to the papacy in 1798. 
because he took uh, the Pope captive and he died in captivity, giving the, the beast a deadly wound. If you think about Revelation chapter 13, these two powers of, of Revelation chapter 13, the papacy and the United States of America, which is the second beast uh, from verses, I think, 10 or 11 on of Daniel uh, Revelation 13, are the two main powers at the end of time. All right. And the only other, so the, it, at the end of time, what we see throughout all time is that the king of the south always represented uh, godlessness. You know, the Egyptians didn't want anything to do with God. You know, when you saw Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, who is this God that we should, you know, listen to him or obey him? You know, uh, that's the attitude. It's really some ideologies between those who have no God, you know, they, they, they're uh, secular or or atheistic which rep is represented by Egypt which is the king of the south today and those who are th the papacy basically which wants to be God he wants to sit on the throne you know just like Lucifer wanted to be like God the papacy is his extension on earth in human form so it's the battle and, and, and these two powers are both uh, in reality uh, in the same boat in reality but the king of the south the ideology of godlessness and and secularism all of that has to be also swallowed up by the papacy to have the whole world wander after the beast if you go into the scriptures the real king of the north you see this is in reality uh the papacy is trying to be the king of the north but in reality there's only one real king of the north and that is the lord god almighty jesus christ right because where is Zion? On the sides of the north. So therefore, who's the king of that Zion? The Lord. So this is all a counterfeit system. And you have, so the king of the north, king of the south, both counterfeit, well, I wouldn't say that the king of the south is counterfeit. Is a re they're actually honest, right? They're honest. They, 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 they just don't believe in God. They don't follow God. They're godless. But the king of the north is, is a deceiver. He pretends to be, go uh, you know, godly, but in reality, he's also godless. He's actually pagan. He worships Satan. So, these two powers will actually come together and they will come against God's remnant people. And that's where we saw last week that uh, where Edom, Moab, and Ammon come into play. And those are those that are the bloodline of, uh, uh, I would say, the Abrahamic bloodline, I would say. So, uh, last week we showed that the king of the north is the papacy and that the king of the south is atheism and secularism as I just mentioned now. And these are two opposing ideologies, as we just talked about. One thinks to be God, while the other detests the thought of God. We saw that this battle will come to its climax just before the coming of Christ, because the king of the north will work to bring the entire world under his dominion. And he's been working at this for many, many years. I would say probably centuries centuries um when you come on just i'm just gonna ask that you please keep your mics on mute all right thanks so he's been working at this and chipping away chipping away at uh, liberty and and you know causing wars causing destruction causing and even now with this country that we're in now which is a very young country the country of america is only uh you know maybe two three hundred and something years old something like that since uh you know it's the the or i would say since 1776 i would say somewhere around there where we started to really get everything in place in, the, in this country so you know several hundred years old is this country is very young it's a baby um but only two or three hundred years old and already we're seeing that this country is starting to form an image to the beast and we're going to look at some very serious statements today uh from certain uh uh, I would say news agencies showing some serious things and how prophecy is really, really, really being fulfilled very quickly today. So we saw that the, uh, the battle will come to its climax just before the coming of Christ. And we also saw that the remnant, which are termed Edom, Moab, and Ammon, will be the only living beings that will escape his deceptions and control. So those are really... God's remnant people at the end of time, which the Bible describes as the 144,000. Now, in this week's study, I want to concentrate on the fact that the 
I'm not going to look at all these symbols and all that. I want to concentrate on something very important. The fact that the king of the north is increasing in power. We really didn't touch that last week. That's why I did decide to do a part two. Because I wanted to emphasize more on the actual title and, and, and subject matter of this study. Which is that the king of the north is increasing in power. So I'm going to read some quotations uh, from the Spirit of Prophecy and some from uh, some articles like the New York Times and things like that, just to give you an idea of how serious these prophecies are and, and how true they are. Now, in the book Darkness Before Dawn, page 27, paragraph 1, Inspiration says, The influence of Rome in the countries that once acknowledged her dominion is still far from being destroyed. And prophecy foretells a restoration of her power. Remember, Rome, especially when it was, well, I would say in both phases, you know, even pagan Rome and papal Rome, the influence of Rome was so wide, so huge, that it was a world power. Pagan Rome was a worldwide power. It, it took over major, major uh, geographical areas of the world. And it was a world power for the longest out of all the world powers that we see in prophecy, especially in the book of Daniel. You know, you had uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome. Rome was the, the longest lasting power. Over 600 years, that's six centuries, over six centuries this power ruled the world. All right? And then after it became... Uh, Papal Rome, you know, it still had its influence, and its influence is very far-reaching as well. So the, but notice what it says here: the influence of Rome in the countries that once acknowledged her dominion is still far from being destroyed. That means it's it has not been destroyed in those countries that once acknowledged her dominion. You know. And people think that because it received a deadly wound, that was her influence was gone, and uh, you know she had to. Con con but no, it says here, those countries still are far. The influence that Rome has is far from being destroyed, and prophecy foretells a restoration of her power. I saw one of his heads, and this is quoting uh, the Bible. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Right? That's in the book of Revelation. The infliction of the deadly wound points to the downfall of the papacy in 1798. After this, says the prophet, his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Paul states plainly that the man of sin will continue until the second advent. That means that this power will still be uh, very influential pulling strings behind the scenes in every major uh, wherever any major player exists and it will continue until the second advent. This will be the main power on earth controlling things and trying to bring the world into one system even until the second advent. That means what you saw in Daniel 11, 40-45, that power that, will, that is termed the king of the north is absolutely the papacy. That's the power that will continue until the second advent. And this is, a, uh, she was quoting 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 to 8. She says, To the very close of time, he will carry forward the work of deception. Now, that's how he works. He's working behind the scenes, and it is as if he's not working because he's, he's using deception to cloak himself with a veil so that you don't think it is the papacy doing all these things and pulling all these strings. But if you notice, all of the major players, they go to the Vatican to get counsel. Right? That's what they do. They go there to get directions and counsel. Even the major players of social media who have just gone to 
uh, the Vatican just uh, probably a month ago. You had the big players from Facebook, you know, Twitter, all of these people. They go to the Vatican to get counsel, to get directives. This power is so influential that leaders of nations go there to get directives and counsel. So it is working in secret, and this is why it says to the very close of time, he will carry forward the work of deception. Because you'll never know that it's that power behind the scenes working out his agenda. The agenda of the one that that power serves, which is Satan. That power does not serve God. It doesn't serve Jesus Christ. But it comes as an angel of light, just like we read in the Bible. That's why it says Satan's ministers, they transform themselves into ministers of light. And that's what the papacy appears to be on the outside. Let's continue with uh, this quotation. It says, And the revelator declares, also referring to the papacy, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Notice, how many? All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, quoting Revelation 13, 8. So those who are not written in the book of life, who are not going to be finally included in the 144,000, at the end, are the, they are the ones that are going to be worshipping the papacy. Those who are not written in the Lamb's book of life. In both the old and the new world, the papacy will receive homage in the honor paid to the Sunday institution that rests solely upon the authority of the Roman Church. This is going to be the what's going to bring the great controversy to its climax. We'll get to a Sunday institution. And she will try to get the world to worship her by accepting this spurious institution. Now, in an article that I found in the New York Times written by Jason Horowitz, entitled, Pope Francis may not change the world, but he is reshaping the church. Notice what it says here. And it's, it's kind of eerie when you think about it in relation to, uh, uh, especially not that one, but the, the, the following quotations that I'm going to read to you, they are seriously eerie in regard to uh, prophecies that we have studied. So notice here, this is from the New York Times, written by Jason Horowitz. He said, In a ceremony at St. Peter's Basilica on Saturday, Francis will create 13 new cardinals. Now, notice here, I, I highlighted this and I, and I put it in bold. Francis will create 13 new cardinals who reflect his pastoral style and priorities on a range of issues, end quote. Now, this took place on or around October 5th, 2019. The King of the North began to implant puppet leaders into his organization. Because a lot of the people in his organization really don't like his liberal stance. Because uh, a lot of them are conservative. So, he had to get rid of many and plant his own puppets in place. Now, why do you think he did that? Notice here. These men that he has implanted who have his pastoral style and priorities, you know what these are? These are yes men that will do exactly what they are told. The article goes on to reveal the motive behind this move by Francis. Notice what the article continues to say, quote, The appointments of these yes men, right, are a landmark for Francis, who now reaches a tipping point of influence to shape the future church in his image. Notice, it uses even that term image. 
what does Revelation say? That there will be an image made to the beast. The New York Times uses the same language of Revelation. Francis is seeking to shape the future church in his image. The article calls this move by the King of the North a tipping point. In other words, this is the point where things begin to intensify toward getting the world, not just the church, to take on his image or the image of the beast. The first beast of Revelation chapter 13. Wow. Now, did the Bible predict this? Absolutely, yes, it did. Where? In the book of Revelation, as we just said. The second beast of Revelation makes an announcement by way of instituting new laws that speak, because that's how any beast power speaks. It institutes laws. And this is what those laws say. Revelation 13, 14. These laws, they say to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live exactly what the New York Times says is the agenda of Francis in doing what? Creating new cardinals and get, getting rid of and cleaning house basically. The article goes on to say Francis wants an inclusive church that welcomes back into the fold Catholics who felt geographically, pastorally, and ideologically alienated. Brethren, Pope Francis is not just talking about Catholics by denomination. If you would have heard some of his speeches a few years past, Francis revealed that he believes that all Christians are truly Catholics. They are just daughters of the Mother Church. The Bible calls the King of the North Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And that's found in Revelation chapter 17, verse 5. So this is symbolic Babylon, the King of the North in the time of the end. A mammoth system that has reproduced its principles in all other religious entities which the Bible terms as daughters. You know that the New York Times article actually reiterates the fact that the King of the North or symbolic Babylon is creating a one world church system patterned after its image. Notice here, again from the article, by appointing cardinals and more than a thousand bishops on the front lines of the faith, Francis is reconstituting a church in his image. Wow. This is very serious. These people don't realize they're actually quoting or agreeing with prophecy. This is absolutely what Revelation chapter 13 has predicted. And we're seeing this right now. They're even admitting it in the New York Times that this is exactly what the papacy is doing right now. And it went into full speed in 2019. So think about it. We're almost in 2022. Do you think he's about got his agenda already put together? I would say so. The Bible tells us that the good old United States of America, the second beast of Revelation 13, will, through its apostate Protestant churches, deceive its members into accepting the papacy as its image. But how? How will these Protestant churches, and as I said earlier in this quote that I just, uh, my comment, apostate Protestant churches which is supposed to be well if they're apostate of course they're not going to be really protesting but they were supposed to be originally they were Protestant churches that eventually became apostate now Rome has a system of infiltrators called the Jesuits who have infiltrated all major religious institutions 
of all denominations and even major institutions of learning in the general uh, a- academic you know, environment. But how is it that he's going to deceive the apostate, or I would say Protestant churches, into accepting the papacy as its image? Revelation 13, 14 says, And he deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Think about that. People are looking for some miracles to come in the end where they, they, you know, they think fire is going to come down from heaven literally and there's going to be some galactic thing. Listen, brethren, this, is already, this has already been taking place for years. Miracles. In the apostate Protestant churches, Satan has been doing things to get people to accept the image of the beast unknowingly. Because people will believe miracles even if their church system contradicts the Bible. You know that old saying, seeing is believing. It's the Thomas Syndrome, brethren. In Darkness Before Dawn, again in page 27, paragraph 2, Inspiration says, With Protestant teachers, there is the same claim of divine authority for Sunday keeping and the same lack of scriptural evidence as with the papal leaders who fabricated miracles to supply the place of a command from God. The assertion that God's judgments are visited upon men for their violation of Sunday Sabbath will be repeated and already it is beginning to be urged and a movement to enforce Sunday observance is fast gaining ground. We're seeing this all over the world. Of course, Satan is, he's bound by God's permissive will until God's servants are fully sealed in their foreheads. Therefore, he can't run faster than God permits. This is why we read in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, that there's four angels holding back the winds of strife till God's servants are sealed in their foreheads. So in other words, what will uh, finally bring in the Sunday law is when God's servants are sealed in their foreheads. When God's servants are sealed in their foreheads, I mean, you can hear the Sunday law rumbling, and it's rumbling, yes. The, 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 the sound of a, of a Sunday law coming is rumbling all over the earth right now, all over, in many countries, all over the world. But that, those final things that are coming are restricted by God's people getting ready. When they are ready, when they are sealed, that's when God can say, okay, now, do what you're going to do. He releases the angels and tells them no longer hold hold the winds. Things are going to start happening. Not to say that the Sunday law will not start coming in stages, but at the same time, God's people are being sealed, and as they're being sealed, God will, will start loosening the winds. And that's how it works. But notice here that papal leaders fabricated miracles to supply the place of the commands from God. You see, when people see miracles in these churches that are apostate, that are not keeping the, the real commandments of God or the principles of God's kingdom. The way that Satan keeps them in these counterfeit churches is by causing the leadership to work miracles in those churches. These are spurious miracles, by the way, brethren. They're, I mean, but they're... they're but they're of a supernatural, uh, you know, uh, they, they are of a supernatural nature. You know, these are demons working things that look like miracles to deceive the members of those churches to remain in those churches and thinking that those churches are teaching the truth. That's how even the papal leaders did to keep the people in check in place of following the commands of God. 
So we're not waiting for some some universal miracles to come to bring deception. These miracles have already been taking place. You see all these guys, Benny Hinn, Crefo Dollar, you know, uh, all of these mega church preachers and all over the place. That's, that's how Satan uses these men to keep people in deception. Wow. This is how the king of the north is increasing in power. And these churches are now aligning themselves with the papacy. And they've been doing that for many years now. Remember a few years ago, this Jesuit Pope apologized for all of the atrocity, atrocities that the Catholic Church had committed against Christians. It started to bring the ecumenical movement in warp speed, if you want to use that term. So these things have already been put in place. All of these leaders, the kings of the earth, are already ready to give the papacy or the beast its power to, to give it give everything to the papacy. Brethren, this is we're, we're right there already. The king of the north is increasing power, and you would ask, what power then? The the brethren, the power that the papacy has, remember it works in secrecy, it works in, in it's called a mystery. The power of uh, of this uh, this beast of revelation, uh, this king of the north, the power that it has is the power of influence and deception. And it doesn't have to be in the open because power of deception is exactly what it says it is. It is gaining more and more power through deception. That means people don't even know what's happening. They don't know. Only God's remnant will know and those who are paying attention and who are who have their eyes open and their hearts completely surrendered will eventually they will eventually uh, have their eyes open. Now another quotation from Darkness uh, to Dawn page 28 paragraph 1 it says as the battle between good and evil reaches its climax every person on earth will have to make a choice for against, or against God. What are the issues and how we may stand firm for what is right? From the very beginning of the great controversy in heaven, it has been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. Now, a lot of people say, oh, what are you talking about this law, law, law? It's the law of God is really the principles of agape love, brethren. So don't, don't be thrown off by the word law of God. It means the principles of agape love, which can never be abolished, by the way. You can't abolish love, because if you abolish love, you're going to be abolishing God. So notice here, from the very beginning of the great controversy, it was Satan's purpose to overthrow this law of love of God. It was to accomplish this that he entered upon his rebellion against the Creator, and though he was cast out of heaven, he has continued the same warfare upon the earth to deceive men and thus lead them to transgress God's law is the object which he has steadfastly pursued whether this be accomplished by casting aside the law altogether or by rejecting one of its precepts the result will be ultimately the same you see Satan doesn't care about abolishing all Ten Commandments if he can just get one if he could just get the whole world to turn against one of them, he reaches his objective. Because the results will be ultimately the same. He that offends in one point manifests contempt for the whole law. His influence and example are on the side of transgression. He becomes guilty of all. And that's also quoting James chapter 2 and verse 10. Reading on in verse 2, it says, In seeking to cast contempt upon the divine statutes, Satan has perverted the doctrines of the Bible. And errors have thus become incorporated into the faith of thousands who profess to believe the scriptures. The last great conflict between truth and error is but the final struggle of the long-standing controversy concerning the law of God. Upon this battle we are now entering a battle between the laws of men and the precepts 
of Jehovah, between the religion of the Bible and the religion of fable and tradition. You see, if you look around you, brethren, you will see that almost everybody is caught in the web. And I don't mean the internet, the wide web, you know, the, the world wide web. Uh, even though I do mean a world wide web, yeah, I'm not talking about the internet. I'm talking about the web that has been weaved of deception. If you look around, almost everyone is in the deception. That means everyone is ripe. They're ripe. And so it will not be long before uh, all of this comes to a climax. This is why we need to take this information in and continue to fight the good fight of faith. And let the same way we see these things intensifying in the world, let our faith become intensified. That's what we need to do. We need to intensify our faith. How? By praying for it, by believing for it, and by grabbing a hold of it, uh, by grabbing a hold of the promises of Jesus Christ. Great Controversy, page 563, paragraph 2, says that the defenders of popery declare that the church has been mis or maligned. And the Protestant world are inclined to accept the statement. I'm going to read that again because I don't know if that passed over our heads. Notice what it says. The defenders of popery, that means those who defend the papacy, declare that the church, the papal church, has been maligned. And the Protestant world are inclined to accept the statement. Now this was written a long time ago. I mean, over a hundred and something years ago. But guess what? Today we see the fruits of the reality of that statement. All of the churches have forgiven and believed the, 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 the false, the false uh, insinuation that the church was maligned. That, that, that we're, everyone's looking at the church in the wrong way. That the church is not that bad. The church has changed. The church has become now just like every other church. And it wants peace in the world. And it wants unity. And we should accept everyone. Listen, the papacy has said that everyone is basically going to be, be, be forgiven. It's like now teaching universalism. This pope is preaching universalism, brethren. Can you imagine that? So has the papacy changed? Absolutely not. It has not changed. But what is it doing? It is pretending to change. It is teaching lies. It is saying that everyone is now accepted. It doesn't believe that. The papacy doesn't believe that. It is speaking things that it doesn't believe. And the world is saying, yeah, okay, we believe you. We believe you've changed. The defenders of popery declare that the church has been, a, a, has been maligned and the Protestant world are inclined to accept the statement. They've already accepted the statement, by the way. This was written a hundred and something years ago. They, they have already accepted the statement. Many urge that it is unjust to judge the church of today by the abomination of, and absurdities that marked her reign during the centuries of ignorance and darkness. They excuse her horrible cruelty as a result of the barbarism of the times and plead that the influence of modern civilization has changed her sentiments. Remember, this is for us, brethren, who are not to be deceived. This is for those who are awake. This message here today, the King of the North is increasing in power. Part 2, as we're looking at the increasing of this power, is so that you and I are not deceived by what we're seeing all around us. Because as far as the world is concerned, the papacy has changed. It has become now a very meek and humble entity that goes around and accepts everyone. The Muslims, the Buddhists, the atheists, homosexuals, everyone. Pope, the Pope said even 
the, the atheists can be saved because if they just follow the convictions of their heart you know that even though they don't believe they don't they reject God that they're, they're gonna be saved brethren there is a truth that heathen will be saved some heathen if you read Romans chapter 2 uh, around verse 18 in there those that have not the law do by nature the things in the so there is a truth in that but that's not what he means that's not what the papacy is saying okay the papacy is lying the papacy does not change and has not changed the prophecies of the Bible are absolute and have never failed and will never fail because God knows the end from the beginning and he's given us this truth for a long time now the book of Revelation was written many 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 years ago over almost you know over 1700 years ago you know 1800 years a long time ago maybe 19 19 years uh, 1900 years ago and it doesn't change because somebody says it changed the papacy doesn't change because the Pope is out there declaring that it changed no there's something wrong there that's not lining up with prophecy that means someone is lying is it that the prophecies are wrong and or is it that this man is lying I would put my uh, stake on the, the reality that this man is lying. Great Controversy, page 563, paragraph 3 says, talking about those who claim that the papacy has changed, it says, Have these persons forgotten the claim of infallibility put forth for eight hundred years which is now over a, a thousand years I would say uh, by this haughty power so far from being relinquished this claim has been affirmed in the 19th century with greater positive positiveness than ever before as Rome asserts that she quote never erred and never can err end quote how can she renounce the principles which governed her course in past ages. She can't, and she won't, in her inner circle. See, she puts on a front to the general population. But in the inner circles, they know what their agenda is. And they know what they're trying to do. They're trying to get the world to worship the beast. And by doing that is to worship the dragon. Satan said he wanted to be like God, sit on the throne of God, and guess what? He's trying to do that on planet Earth. He's trying to make planet Earth his throne and become the God of this planet. But even though many worship him as the God of this world, he is not really the God of anything. He's not a God. He's, an, he's a fallen angel. That's what he is. A God cannot be made. So he cannot make himself. You know, you, you talk about the mafia. They call themselves made men. Well, he cannot be a made God. He cannot. It doesn't apply. No. He has made himself a fallen angel. So he can, he can claim that. But he can't claim to be God. Notice here in uh, Great Controversy 564, paragraph 1. The papal church will never relinquish her claim to infallibility. All that she has done in her per persecution of those who reject her dogmas, she holds to be right. And would she not repeat the same acts? Should the opportunity be presented? She would absolutely do the same thing. That's why the Bible predicts that those who do not worship the papacy by worshiping the false institution of the papacy will be put to death. The Bible says this very clear in Revelation chapter 13. So we see this as an absolute fact. The papacy will repeat the same acts. It's just that you won't know it's the papacy. It might look like the governments. It might look like the, you know, Homeland Security or who knows what. It might look like a different entity because she's working in secret. That's why it's called Mystery Babylon the Great. 
it might not it won't appear as if it's the papacy doing it at the end of time it will appear as if, as if it's all these other earthly governments doing it but in reality she's the one behind this, pulling the strings Great Controversy goes on and says, Let the restraints now imposed by secular governments be removed and Rome be reinstated in her former power and there would speedily be a revival of her tyranny and persecution. Brethren, I'm going to say something now. That's what we're starting to see now. The tyranny that we're seeing that looks like it's coming from governments is taking place because Rome has been reinstated in her former power. She is just now unleashing it little by little. Because if she did it all at one time, there would be civil war as never been seen on this planet and a lot of these people in power, they would all be murdered. Because... Especially in America, I'll tell you that much. I don't know, I can't speak for every other country because I don't live in these other countries and I don't know how these other countries are formed or how their societies are, you know, in regards to armaments. But I know that in America, society is very well armed. So if they pushed too hard at once, there would be a bloody civil war and many of these people that hold seats of power they will be they would be executed and they don't want that to happen they don't want these things to happen so the papacy is working very s s slowly kind of not really slowly but in a in a way where people are are, are going to get used to it and people will accept it and that's what we're seeing now we're seeing tyranny being implemented in governments all across the world including america and society is little by little getting used to it and accepting it. And unfortunately, two-thirds of the population have no clue of what's going on. And they're going along like the frog being boiled in the pot of water. Little by little, the heat is being turned up and they don't even realize what's going on. Eventually, they'll be boiled to death. And, they, and, and it's because they are oblivious because of sports, internet, video games, movies, whatever. Whatever is diverting their attention. They are not seeing what's happening. Two-thirds of the population, unfortunately. That's about uh, how much I think exists that are totally la-la land. All right? But these things are actually, and, and we see them, and, you know, it's our job to give the trumpet a certain sound and kind of wake people up. You know, not in a crazy way, but asking God to give us wisdom to know how to speak to people to, and share things with them to kind of help them to wake up from their stupor. Now, in uh, a Great Controversy 564, paragraph 2, it says, uh, and this is um, from Josiah Strong, uh, in our country, page 46, 48. It's quoting that. It's quoting something that says that, that Josiah Strong... Uh, in that book, Our Country, page 4648, speaks thus of the attitude of the papal hierarchy as regards freedom of conscience and of the perils which especially threaten the United States from the success of her policy. Now notice now that they were speaking about this over 100 years ago. How, you know, the papal hierarchy and how, how it regards freedom of conscience. The papal hierarchy, brethren, actually uh, hates freedom of conscience. It hates even the American Constitution because it gives people too many liberties in their estimation. Notice what Great Controversy, page 564, paragraph 3, states. There are many who are disposed to attrib att attribute any fear of Roman Catholicism in the United States to bigotry or childishness. Such see nothing in the character and attitude of Romanism that is hostile to our free institutions or find nothing portentous in its growth. Let us then first compare some of the fundamental principles of our government with those of the Catholic Church 
Notice here, it reads on in, in, in page 4. The Constitution of the United States, brethren, guarantees liberty of conscience. And this is the, what, was, what was the greatest threat to the papal takeover of the world. America has been a thorn in the agenda of the papacy. We have been the ones that have been keeping the papacy at bay for a while now. For at least the last couple hundred years. Because of the Constitution. The papacy does not believe in liberty of conscience. Notice here, the Constitution of the United States guarantees liberty of conscience. Nothing is dearer or more fundamental. Pope Pius IX, in his encyclical letter of August 15, 1854, said the following, quote, this is from the papacy now, quote, the absurd and erroneous doctrines or ravings in defense of liberty of conscience are a most pestilential error, a pest of all others most to be dreaded in a state. End quote. Think about that. That's the real sentiment of the papacy in regards to the Constitution, or especially liberty of conscience, which is embodied in the Constitution of the United States of America. Why do you think you see now that the Constitution no longer holds any water. You no longer have the freedom of speech. Look what all the social media platforms are doing. Censoring people from speaking freely. Media blackouts. You know, all of these things. You see, the Constitution is not holding any water. Now, there's still some people in high office that are God is using to kind of defend, you know, these principles and to also hold back the winds. But little by little, these things are being eroded. And they started being eroded in a rapid pace, as I, I mentioned last week, since 9-11, 2001. But let me continue reading. The same Pope, in his encyclical letter of December 8, 1864, anathematized, quote, those who assert the liberty of conscience and of religious worship, end quote. Also, quote, all such as maintain that the church may not employ force, end quote. Wow. I mean, I, I, I really hope that you're getting what this is saying, dear listener, because this is serious. I'm going to read several more quotes before we close here. 564 paragraph 5 says, the pacific tone of Rome in the United States does not imply a change of heart. She is tolerant where she is helpless. I'll say that again. The papacy is tolerant where she is helpless. Says Bishop O'Connor, quote, Religious liberty is merely endured until the opposite can be carried into effect without peril to the Catholic world. End quote. Also, the Archbishop of St. Louis once said, quote, Heresy and unbelief are crimes. And in Christian countries, as in Italy and Spain, for instance, where all the people are Catholics, and where the Catholic religion is an essential part of the law of the land, they are punished as other crimes. Notice, heresy and unbelief and unbelief were crimes in places like Italy and Spain that were punished as other crimes. That means you can go to jail for unbelief. Wow. Some people think this could never happen in America. But brethren, Prophecy has warned us. Remember, God reveals His secrets to His servants, the prophets. And these things were given to us so that we're not caught unaware. The punishment of unbelief in the dogmas of Rome will be reignited in this country and the world. 
there's going to be an ultimate death decree that will be placed against God's true commandment-keeping people once they are sealed. Right after, after they're sealed, this will happen. Now, notice here, every cardinal, and this is again, Great Controversy 565, paragraph 1, every cardinal, archbishop, and bishop in the Catholic Church takes an oath of allegiance to the Pope, in which occur the following words, quote, heretics, schismatics, and rebels to our said Lord the Pope. Notice who the Lord is. It's not our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does this say again? Every cardinal every archbishop and every bishop in the Catholic Church, basically all of the leaders of the Catholic Church, all of them have to take an oath of allegiance in which they call the Pope the Lord. Notice here, and they also promise to persecute and oppose those who go against the papacy. Heretics, schismatics, and rebels to our said Lord the Pope or his aforesaid successors, I will to my utmost persecute and oppose. Brethren, persecution and opposition to God's people is taking place and has been taking place for, I would say, since the beginning of Christianity. It has never really ended. Never. It's still taking place today and it will intensify in a massive scale. That's what we're seeing now. We're getting now to a place where they're getting us used to tyranny so that we just accept it. Nobody stands up and fights and causes any civil war. In other words, everybody just sits back and waits as it gets hotter and hotter inside the boiling pot. Three more quotations, and we close. Great Controversy 565, paragraph 2, and 3, and, 50, and 566, paragraph 1. Final three quotations. Notice here. It is true that there are real Christians in the Roman Catholic Communion. So, if you're listening out there and you might be Catholic, or you know, this is not any teaching against Catholic or Catholic people. Um, it is again, there is a problem with Catholicism, but there's true Christians in the Catholic Communion. That's for sure. There's a lot of good people who love the Lord, and I would say not only in the Catholic Church but in every church, every denomination. There's people who really love God with all of their heart, and they 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 don't know. Uh, necessarily uh, what we know or they don't know you know all of the things that God requires in his word but because the main requirement which is that they're surrendered to him and they have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior they are secure God accepts everyone who accepts him that's a reality even if they don't really understand some of these things that we're talking about today so it is true absolutely true that there are real Christians in the Roman Catholic Communion. Thousands in that church are serving God according to the best light that they have. They are not allowed access to His Word. That's why many of them are in ignorance to the things that we're talking about today because we're talking about some deep things in prophecy. So they are in that condition because they are not allowed access to His Word and therefore they do not discern the truth. They have never seen the contrast between a living heart service and a round of mere forms and ceremonies. God looks with pitying tenderness upon these souls, educated as they are in a faith that is delusive and unsatisfying. He will cause rays of light to penetrate the dense darkness that surrounds them. Praise the Lord. He will reveal to, these, to them the truth as it is in Jesus, and many will yet take their position with God's people. Praise God. At the end of time, when the Mark of the Beast crisis finally comes to a full-fledged uh, battle, those that are true and sincere will come out of Babylon, and they will join God's church, in, uh, those that know the truth, those that have the light of the truth. Praise God. Final two quotes. It says here, But Romanism as a system is no more in harmony with the gospel of Christ now than at any former period in her history. The Protestant churches are in great darkness as well, or they would discern the signs of the times. The Roman church is far-reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She is employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation. Preparation for what? For a fierce and determined conflict to regain control 
of the world, that's number one, to re-establish persecution, number two, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. Three objectives of the papacy. What are they? Number one, control of the world. Do we see that the world is coming under, under one main control? Absolutely. All the countries of the world are doing the same, very same thing. Why? The same people are behind the scenes pulling the same strings. You wouldn't see every country in the world doing the same exact thing if they weren't being pulled by an entity. They weren't be gui being guided by an entity that's behind the scenes that has the same agenda. So what are we seeing? The papacy is trying is, is right now regaining control of the world. Right now. If it doesn't already have it. It has probably the leadership of the world, but it's now trying to get the people's of the world under its control so it, it has it's 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 moving in stages so but notice regain control of the world re-establish persecution that's happening in small pockets all around the world it's gonna happen in America as well hasn't reached here in such a big in a small way it's kinda happening because we're seeing churches being affected by these strings that are being pulled they're, not, they're being shut down. Uh, a lot of things... Are, these, this is a form of persecution, by the way. It is absolutely a form of persecution because it violates the Constitution, which gives you a freedom to worship, freedom of religion. But because they have come up with a, a, a smokescreen, a, a precursor, a, 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 a thing which we call a false flag or something that they can use to do away with the Constitution, that's what they're doing. So persecution has absolutely begun as well. So we see here, regain control of the world, that's happening. Reestablish persecution, that's happening. And to undo all that Protestantism has done, that is happening. And I would say probably has already happened. Because all of those churches that claim to be Protestants are no longer protesting. So has it undone all that Protestantism has done? Absolutely. These three objectives, brethren, have already been uh, uh, fulfilled have been accomplished to a certain degree they will continue to be fulfilled fulfilled in a more intense way as we get closer and closer to the final battle between good and evil Catholicism brethren is gaining ground upon every side see the increasing number of her churches and chapels in Protestant countries Look at the popularity of her colleges and seminaries in America. Do you know that the Jesuits have took control and have inf inf infiltrated every major Ivy League uh, college in America? Every single one of them. So she's already accomplished this. Look at the popular popularity of her colleges and seminaries in America so widely patronized by Protestants. Look at the growth of ritualism in England and the frequent defections to the ranks of the Catholics these things should awaken the anxiety of all who prize the pure principles of the gospel this doesn't mean that we should be anxious in a negative way notice what it says in the spirit of prophecy these things should awaken the anxiety of all who prize the pure principles of the, that's, of the gospel that's talking about me and you so these things that we're looking in this study today should awaken the anxiety of us. Not in a negative way, as I said. Anxiety could be negative, but it could also be something positive. We could be anxious. Anxious for what? To have the character of God fully reproduced in us so that we can be ready to stand against the Prince of Darkness and all of his foes, all of his, you know, his, his agents. Final quotation, Great Controversy 566, paragraph 1. Protestants have tampered with and patronized popery. They have made compromises and concessions with papists themselves, uh, which, which papists themselves are surprised to see and fail to understand. Men are closing their eyes to the real character of Romanism 
and the dangers to be apprehended from her supremacy. The people need to be aroused to resist. This is another thing we should be anxious for. Anxious to resist. The people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to the civil and religious liberty. Praise the Lord, brethren. So, brethren, if anything, my prayer is that this, these two studies, these two parts, first, proved that the King of the North is the papacy, that that will be the final power, pulling the strings behind the scenes, and that it is increasing in power exponentially, and it should awaken something in us, an anxiety to have the character of God finally fully reproduced in us so that we can be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. This is the call that God has given to us. He says, expose the works of darkness. And this is what we're doing. But we need to become intelligent. We need to know what these things are. We need to understand what this prophecy of Daniel 11, 40 to 45 Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 18, 17, all of these things we need to understand and be able to sh show people. You know, these are not things for us to just listen to here and, and let it to go through one ear and out the other. It's for us to take note, to go back, to look at these things, to study them, to become familiar with them, to be able to teach them to others and show them these powers, even those that are in, um, in these uh, apostate Protestant churches. Because... God wants us to reach these individuals that are true, real Christians in these false systems. Yes, He wants us to reach them. He wants us to seek for them. He wants us to pray for God to bring them into our midst so that we can help them, so we can be co-laborers with God to help them to come into the truth and be protected by all the deception that is going to intensify in a massive scale. Brethren, I want to thank God for you all for uh, attending and listening uh, very attentively to this study. And I pray that uh, God will bless each and every one of us with this anxiety, this good anxiety that we need so that we can really move forward as soldiers of the cross. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this wonderful study. Lord, we, we pray for this anxiety, the good anxiety, for the desire to to really have your character fully reproduced in us. And so help us to fight that good fight of faith. Help us to struggle with the enemy called self and sin so that we can truly be instruments to be able to go out and wake up these people that are true in these Babylonian systems who really love you with all their heart and just waiting for somebody to come and show them the light. Show them the truth of what's happening. And dear Father, we know that because your Holy Spirit is guiding them, they will see it and they will come in and come out of Babylon. Dear Father, help us to be that angel in Revelation 18 that, that calls those out of Babylon. But we need Babylon to come out of us first, Lord. So give us that anxiety that we need. Continue to bless each and every one of us that, and those that are within the hearing of, of my voice and who may watch this study maybe later on. Continue to uh, help us to understand these things for spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And we need your Holy Spirit to understand these things. And go back and see that these things are so. And so dear Father. Let this be a trumpet. That many can hear. And that it will arouse. To a place of anxiety. Good anxiety. Where they realize they need to understand and study these things. And, and to really get their hearts right for the final battle. Because those who do not. Uh, and, and play games with religion and play games with Christ are ultimately going to be in a bad spot. But dear Father, help us never to play games at all. Help us to be serious Christians, dedicated and surrendered to you every moment of our lives. We thank you, dear God. We praise you and we ask these things according to your will. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we thanksgiving. Amen and amen.